Welcome back to Hiking with Kathleen. Thanks for joining me today. We just had a recent rain and it had been almost three weeks, you know, since our last rainfall. So I'm out here exploring that, but there are things that definitely happen at this time of year. There are baby animals, whether they're baby waterfowl, uh, other baby birds, some are ready to actually have their second uh, brood of nestlings at this time. Um, but also there's mammals that are having babies. The one thing that we're gonna see in this video is that this is turtle egg laying season in the month of June. So I came across a snapping turtle and you'll have a chance to see what that looks like so that you know signs to look for if in fact a turtle is laying eggs. So we'll see that and there's occasional visitors to this area of southwestern Ontario that may have flown off course. You'll have a chance to see that too. Stay with me. Turtles tend to lay their eggs in the month of June, and right now we're sitting at about June 9th. So I am standing here on the trail because I don't want other hikers who don't notice that this is what's going on, that this snapping turtle is laying her eggs and disturb her. Turtles are increasingly endangered, and so I want to make sure that this female is left undisturbed to lay her eggs and I have tried to reach out to the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority who manages this, uh, this watershed area. And what they do is they dig up the eggs and then they bring them somewhere that's out of reach of predators so that they can incubate them. And once the turtle hatchlings have hatched uh, later this summer, they release them back to the area where they were found. So that gives them the best chance of survival because when the eggs are laid in the nest, that's when they're most vulnerable. There's no way, like the mother doesn't stay to protect them and there's no way for them to ward off predators. So oftentimes raccoons will come by, they see the soft ground where the mother has dug up, uh, the hole that she's uh, laid the eggs in and they realize there's a good dinner waiting for them. So anyway, I wanna help to avoid that and increase the chance of survival for these uh, turtle eggs. If you come across a turtle that's laying her eggs at the side of the road, you know, oftentimes it's females that are most vulnerable because they're the ones that are looking for a place that's dry. Turtles may live in the water or live near water, but they don't lay their eggs in water. They have to, fi they have to find some place that has good drainage. And that's why you'll often see them at the shoulder of the road. They'll maybe dig in the gravel and uh, do that not far away from water, but they have to risk their lives where they often will cross the road. Here's a tip. Sometimes you'll see this where a turtle is crossing the road and we know that snapping turtles can bite. In fact, all turtles can bite, but snapping turtles can become quite large in size. They're the largest turtle we have in North America and they have a long neck. They have very little protection underneath. Um, it's the turtle shell is made up of two parts. 
So there's the carapace, which is the back part. The plastron is the belly part. And if you see it, a snapping turtle, you'll see that it doesn't have the ability to retract its limbs into the safety of its, of its shell. Instead, most of it hangs out. So they have an extra long neck and that allows them to protect themselves around uh, the sides of their body if there's a predator. They also have a long tail, so sometimes people may feel inclined to pick up a snapping turtle by the tail to move it off the road. The intent is great and noble, but that could give the tur the, it could give the turtle a spinal column injury. The best way to handle it is look around for a large branch, put it in front of the turtle's mouth, and drag her in the direction across the road that she was headed in. If you drag her to the nearest side of the road, she'll just turn around and go back to where she wanted to go. So put the turtle, put the branch in front of the turtle's mouth, let her bite, drag her gently across the road without picking her up, and then move her safely off the road. I've done that many times when I've found turtles trying to cross the road. Um, if they're smaller turtles, like painted turtles, certainly you can pick them up and just move them out of the way. This can be a long process, so I don't have a lot of time today. I have some time constraints around my hike today. So uh, I'm hoping that she'll finish her deed and move off into the water. And uh, I've already made a friend who helps to monitor turtle eggs for the Upper Thames, uh, Mary Lou. I referred to her in the, last, uh, in the last video. And she's out hiking too right now, somewhere else. So once she gets my email, I'll be able to give her more specific information as to where this turtle has laid her eggs. So hopefully everybody can band together and help turtles to successfully pass through this egg laying season.
I was asked a question on a recent video by a viewer named Kathy if I would mention the names of the trees and identify some of them. So that's why I wanted to mention that one that I often find when I'm along um, a wetland area is a willow tree. So the thing to notice is the bark and the leaves of the tree and that gives you clues as to the kind of tree it is. Uh, once we get later into the summer, it could be the fruit that they bear, whether it's in the form of, of keys or cones. So those are other helpful clues. Um, what I also am drawn to are things that land on me when I'm out here in the woods. And one such example is this caterpillar. So I bring that to your attention in case there are other folks out there who enjoy not only hiking, but also camping. Because one of the most important things to do when you are camping or hiking is to make sure you're not bringing hitchhikers home. This is what I would call a hitchhiker. Any animal that sort of attaches itself to you and hitches a ride. So sometimes it's on the vehicles. So we always check our, our vehicles, including the wheel wells, the tires themselves, so that you're not spreading a problem. Namely, we have gypsy moth, and gypsy moth are ones that are pretty devastating to trees where they are non-specific. They'll eat many different species of tree leaves and defoliate them. So um, it's always a good idea to just have a look and make sure that you're not bringing home anything that <laughs> you weren't intending to pack up and bring home. I could hear this young bird begging for food from its parent, so I stood and watched for probably 10 minutes. Have a look. That young bird is so much bigger than its parent. It's a bird that was adopted by the parents unknowingly. The young bird is a young cowbird and the parents never raise their own young. In fact, they find smaller bird nests in order to lay their eggs so that somebody else shoulders the burden of raising their baby. And this parent is a song sparrow. That's how it works in nature sometimes.
Often when I'm out here on the trail, I don't identify animals, um, at least not on camera. And a lot of the reasons are, I'm just gonna pick up the video camera and just video whatever I think is interesting and worry about its identification later. So when I started on this trail today, immediately what I saw when I came near that, that pond is a great blue heron. It was on a lower hanging branch and it flew lower. So I wasn't able to find it again. I also saw within fairly close range, a hawk got the camera set up. By then I saw it was long gone. So I don't worry about trying to do any sort of narration at the time because I don't want to frighten animals away. What I'm hoping to do is capture them in a way that they're not stressed and they're maybe not noticing me or paying much attention to me. So, and then I worry about the identification of it afterwards. So that is the reason that I sort of slink through the forest in the hopes of finding some interesting animal behavior and interesting animal sightings that I can bring home to you. So I want to address this because a viewer named Kathy was interested in trees. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll give a brief overview of how you can maybe mm, ID a few species of tree just by knowing one little trick. So I'm standing beside a young tree and this tree has branches that are opposite to one another. So the, what I'm looking at when I say that is this branch grew opposite this one. Likewise, as you continue on up the branch, this one grew opposite to this one. The other arrangement is called alternate, and I'll show you what alternate arrangement looks like. So when you know that there are branches that grow opposite to one another, unless one of the branches has fallen off, which happens when trees are older and uh, maybe a branch gets damaged or gets you know broken off somehow. So this is a young tree with a leaf that we're familiar with. I'll bring it right over to you. This is a maple leaf. And a neat trick to know a grouping of three trees that all have the opposite leaved arrangement in common. The first letter of their name spells the word MAD. M stands for maple. A stands for ash, D stands for dogwood. Maple, ash, dogwood. Those are three tree species that in almost all cases, I know there's uh, an exception with alternate leaf dogwood, but in almost all cases of maples, ash, and dogwood, you'll find that they have opposite leafed arrangements. And so it helps to narrow down what it is you think you might be identifying. 
So that's one way. Now I'm going to find an alternate leaf tree and show you what that looks like. So it helps you to sort of distinguish the alternate and, and opposite um, part. As for ash trees, those are the ones that were hit hard by the emerald ash borer. That was an insect that would bore under the bark of a tree. So the layer directly beneath the bark of a tree is the only living area of the actual tree trunk. And what the, ash, em, um, what the emerald ash borer was doing is it was uh, burrowing directly underneath the uh, directly underneath the bark and that is where it sort of in effect girdled the tree so it separated the bark from the living area of the tree that's directly beneath it so a lot of uh, ash trees have died off um, but as all things in nature take place it's on a cyclical basis so you know there'll be still seeds in the ground from ash trees that didn't die off and uh, when they grow into adult trees we'll have a new generation of ash trees it's just it does take them a number of years in order to get to a good size to become a mature tree so i'll look for an alternate leaved arrangement and be able to end off on that note for you okay it was just on the other side of the trail i was able to find this example of an alternate leaved arrangement so here's what you can notice where there's a leaf one is not growing directly opposite. So there's a leaf here and a leaf here. So they are alternating how they have um, come out of this, this branch, okay? So that's an alternate leaved arrangement. And the other example that I showed you just across the trail there was a maple tree with the opposite leaved arrangement. So that's a way to sort of help make it a little bit easier at least to lump those ones together that have the opposite leaved arrangement. Hope that helps you. So this trail is so aromatic and I'm not exactly sure what wildflower is making it smell so beautiful out here. But I wish you could smell that and really feel immersed in this whole experience. But um, anyway, I want to thank you for joining me on today's hike. It's starting to get <laughs> buggy out here, but the beauty is nonstop. Uh, temperatures aren't going to be all that terribly warm today, probably about 20 degrees Celsius. and. Uh, Shannon and I welcome you to continue to follow us over the summer months where we are soon, less than a week, embarking on our camping trip. We're going to go for almost four weeks and we're heading up uh, the north shore of Lake Superior. So we're staying on the Canadian side and we're going to be visiting a total of about five campgrounds. And when I say about five, we had to book them five months in advance, but there are wildfires that are raging in certain areas of our country. and. Uh, some of the areas that we're planning to go to have a pretty high risk of wildfires starting there because of the dry conditions. Uh, so we'll have to see how things work out. And I mean, there's a lot of people that are suffering losses right now, right, because they're losing uh, perhaps trees that are on their property, um, maybe even their home. So anyway, we hope that this wildfire season comes to a conclusion rather soon. Here in southwestern Ontario, we're lucky that we've had about uh, maybe two and a half days of rain. I just hope that that uh, good luck follows us as we continue on up to Lake Superior. Thanks for following me today, and I hope to see you next Tuesday morning. Bye for now.